Welcome to Supply Chain Talks. My name is Christian Kars Mortensen. I'm a Senior Director, Global Partnerships and Alliances at Project 44. And today I'm also your host for Supply Chain Talks. Project 44 has hand curated a strong partner network to extend and enable the best possible customer experience. During 2021, we welcome you to our partner series, Supply Chain Talks. These conversations touch on current developments in global supply chains and the world of logistics. And today we warmly welcome Mr. Till Dengel, Global Head of Digital Logistics Solutions Management and Vice President at SAP. Till, I'm positively pleased to have you join. Hi, Christian. Thanks for the invitation. Very happy to be here today. Thank you, Till. Until you have worked 20 plus years in SAP and you're globally responsible for the strategy and the thought leadership and the global go-to-market of SAP's digital solutions portfolio. Can you share how you engage and create value with SAP's global clients in this area? Yes, absolutely, Christian. So yeah, indeed, it, it has been a while, uh, over 20 years, and it's been it's been interesting because obviously logistics has been changing over that time. So when I started in 2000, actually, um, logistics or logistics execution, so mostly transportation and warehouse management was very deeply embedded already at that time into the entire enterprise management processes. So customers were really looking to execute logistics end to end. And since then it has evolved obviously across different stages. So while we moved from supply chain execution, so the you know pure execution focus, managing a warehouse, um, you know, managing, managing transportation in terms of freight rating, in terms of uh, manual dispatch, it then over time moved into more automated type of processes, right, with material flow systems, automation in the warehouse, and also in transportation. Data science came in, um, and then you had automated planning and routing systems. And the value of that, of course, I think is, is, is somewhat obvious. Logistics is always about efficiency and how can you squeeze, um, you know, more out of more costs out of the system, uh, optimized loading, uh, things like that. Um, so that that's how it how it evolved over time. And then I would say about five years ago or so, there was another interesting notion with the networks and the visibility part coming into it, where you then suddenly started also with the advent of cloud uh, to bring together the business partners so they could jointly collaborate on a business process for freight collaboration, for tendering, and then of course also for real-time tracking and visibility and then lately doc appointment scheduling. So the industry or the, you know, the line of business has evolved quite a bit um, over time. And um, it has always been, I think efficiency was always the main driver and then load optimization and things like that. But eventually it also moved more into customer centricity and customer service and how can you improve customer service. And that's certainly a notion that we see in the past couple of years. So that's been an interesting ride. And the, the nice thing here is that we work with customers from around the globe. So we see these trends sometimes starting in one region and then branching over into another region. Um, and we have um, standing customer councils and executive councils where you always hear from customers what's driving them, what's going on, and which direction should we be headed um, to make sure that we, that we serve the market properly in the future. Wow, that, that was like a whole uh, history lesson in, <laughs> in the go. Uh, so when you're working with your colleagues and clients, what are like the biggest supply chain pain points you meet in global companies. Um, yeah, the interesting what we talked about before, right? Efficiency was always the big topic in logistics, and that has changed lately. Um, I think the pandemic, um, you know, also contributed to that, and, and and latest incidents like the Suez Canal incident, and then you know ports shutting down because of COVID in China, and that moved up the supply chain resiliency piece. So the the discussions we have currently are mostly around. How can I make my supply chain more robust? How can I be more agile to make sure that the business runs smoothly in the future? Of course, always with efficiency in mind, so efficiency doesn't go away. And then the third area is around this customer centricity piece. So how can I make sure I give, you know, I do that promise to the customer in the right way? Uh, and I promise the goods arrival. And then I also give information while the goods are in motion until they finally arrive at the door. So I think with the advent of, you know, um, of tracking that we now all have in our private lives, when we order something online and receive it 24 hours after, 
um, this is it's certainly the notion that drives this customer service. So that leads to visibility. And then uh, a trend that is um, also very important, or well, actually more than a trend, is that supply chain integrity piece. So where do my goods come from? Who interacted with the goods? Especially as you talk about you know, new business models around um, sustainability or sustainable sourcing and things like that. And that um, leads us into sustainability overall. So I can, how can I strategically manage my supply chain in the most sustainable way looking at the missions, looking at, um, you know, at the details I get from emissions data and how can I plan better and how can I set up my supply chain um, for the future that it, that it runs in the most efficient and uh, sustainable way. I agree with you on, on the sourcing. You know, it's no good anymore for consumers that you produce it in this part of the world, send it over here for packing and come back and sell it. It's no longer acceptable. But still, I was also thinking, uh, do you think we will see, let's say, industry consolidation, increased supply chain complexity and regulatory changes that would be reshaping the supply chain landscape? Yes, absolutely. And I think we are already seeing it, right? So in the 3PL fate forwarding industry, we already see big mergers and acquisitions and consolidation because the, the big players are, you know, they, they move from being an ocean carrier, for example, into an end-to-end -end supply chain provider. And you can talk about, is it a 4PL, is it a 5PL, what kind of models, but really an end-to-end -end, um, supplier or provider of logistic services. So I think that's one thing that's already happening. Um, and that was also um, catalyzed by, um, by, by the COVID um, pandemic and as the market's changing. And then of course, as we see around the world, I mean, shortage of labor uh, in the logistics industry is causing a lot of disruption. Um, oil prices is certainly a big, big topic, right? And then lately, if you look into ocean freight rates and how they've been going up 10 times, 15 times uh, in, in certain areas, and then everything around trade wars and tariffs coming in. So I, I think, you know, this market has been disrupted in the last five years, much, much more than any other market. So um, certainly, and that causes that, you know, that entire focus on resiliency and how can I be agile to quickly adapt because there is so much change coming in. Yeah, container pricing is uh, the <laughs> shock of the year, I think. If we look at, let's say, in, in that respect, supply chain transportation planning, how does SAP support its clients to, let's say, respond quickly and cost effectively to changes in supply demand and market conditions? Mm -hmm. There is, um, I would say there is two levels, right? There's one is the operational response, like it happens right now and I need to respond. And one is more the mid-term, long-term response that I want to strategically set up my network differently. So what was interesting during COVID, what we saw that um, our customers using, for example, our transportation management and our freight collaboration, um, that they were looking into, they certainly had to had to source differently because you know goods were not available or trucks couldn't cross the border, for example. So they had to find other suppliers and then suddenly they had new trade lanes that they needed to support. So automated tendering into a network of carriers that they might not have worked with before, that is a big benefit. Um, the other area that, that we've seen is working more with digital freight forwarders, right? Working more with the Uber freights or the Insta freights of the world, where I can tap into an existing network of tens of thousands of carriers um, that are actually represented by those digital freight forwarders. So that's more the operational piece that we've seen uh, uh, where our customers try to react. And then um, the, the, the uh, strategic layer is, of course, um, looking at all the data, looking at a year's worth of data in your analytics tools, and that, that's the data that's provided by the visibility tools, of course, and by the transportation management tools, um, to then bring into, uh, into the analytics tool to then make decisions and trade-offs, where should I be placing things, right? And the last one, definitely to mention also with the operational piece that I forgot, is um, the rerouting and rescheduling, right? So once you have the visibility of what's going on in the world, um, you of course may want to reroute and reschedule uh, and use an, a transportation management engine um, to do that or to support the dispatchers um, in, the, in the best possible way. Till to, to loop a little bit on, on, on the previous uh, history lesson, if we look at supply chain logistics, how have you observed the way companies manage goods let's say efficiently across warehousing, fulfillment, distribution, and even down to five, final mile differently 
over the last 20 years. Yeah, it's uh, also interesting. And I think it's, it's different um, depending on what industry you look at, of course, but it, it's been moving in, in, in cycles a little bit. So um, it, it, there, there has been this cycle and this notion um, that you do everything in the, in the most integrated way. I remember those days when you know companies were looking at one big ERP system to have everything in globally. And then there was a notion again where customers said, no, I want one system by major region, for example. And then there was also this notion of, um, I either do it integrated or I optimize in the different domains, right? I optimize my warehouse, I optimize my transportation in the most efficient way, I optimize my order management and fulfillment in the most efficient way. And what was, we are seeing right now again is what I would consider uh, supply chain convergence, right? So now the different domains are coming together again. And the main driver in my perspective is that we have, we are all used to these 24 hour delivery windows now, right? We have the expectation I order it and I have it the next day. And you can only do this if you have a fully automated end-to-end -end working process from manufacturing plant or from the supply side order management all the way um, to managing the warehouse, you know, the, the multifaceted uh, value chain, and then eventually the fulfillment and the, the distribution cycle. And if you don't, if you, autom if you um, optimize the silos, that's not always a given, right? So you need to optimize end to end and also have transparency end to end because otherwise you have breaks in the process and that way you cannot keep that customer promise of the 24 hours. So I think that customer promise is really driving the, that integrated supply chain management um, that many companies are now establishing uh, once more. Pri pr price pressure disappears if you know how to deliver perfectly. Yep. Uh, if, if you look into to companies, they face more and more disruptions, that's clear. And that really put the fragility of supply chains at the forefront. So how do you think the sea levels build a business strategy that can create resilience and agility at the same time? Yeah, I think at the business strategies, and it's actually quite interesting because we are involved in a couple of you know, very large digital transformational projects right now um, to really reshape um, existing supply chains. And usually visibility is always first, right? I want to create visibility into and basically map the real time, the, the physical world into the digital world. So I see what's going on. And then secondly, once I have that visibility, I want to be able to react. And if possible, I want to be able to react at scale. So automatically react and reschedule and reroute. Uh, and then the, the, the third layer for me is, and that's where it, where it gets more and more unique, um, is that we are now with you know, the visibility that we have, the real-time visibility that we get data every couple of minutes from the truck, from the ocean, uh, from the ocean container, the, the devices on the container, for example, that we now are starting to establish a data layer that we never had before. We never had that much information about global shipments and global goods in motion as we had before. And then to analyze this data and use, of course, new, tech, you know, new um, technologies around you know, big data crunching, machine learning, AI, and advanced analytics to then start to go and look into the future and to start predicting. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely unique, but all the prediction is not worth anything if you don't have a good data layer underneath it. And then once you can do that prediction, then you can also uh, go more into the long-term uh, planning and long-term strategic um, setup of your supply chain. So that's, I think, what, um, what many companies, or I would say the leaders right now in, in supply chain are establishing. It's those control towers, but then with the control tower, the data lake, and then also the machine learning and the capabilities uh, to actually extract the data, extract the insights from the data, learn from it, and take strategic action. Let's try. You, you mentioned you're working on some some really big companies transformation. So let's try to build on that. If we start, like they say, when a consumer buys anything on an e-commerce platform, they expect immediate visibility into the shipment status, and they get it when the purchase confirmation. But when a global manufacturer procures actually billions of euros of materials from suppliers for their factories, do they currently receive the same kind of visibility as when they personally spend $20 on Amazon? And if the answer is no, what can they do to achieve this? 
I would say it, in many cases it is it is no, and there is certainly the ambition to create that you know consumer grade experience also in a business to business environment. And as you as you say, right, it's sometimes it's it's hundreds or thousands or even millions of dollars of supply that that you are getting, right? So, um, and and that's what what many projects are currently uh, uh, looking at, right? So how can I get that visibility layer into uh, into the uh, into my business, and how can I then, from that visibility layer, uh, who needs that information? Where do I need to supply that information, either directly back to the customer or to my customer service department? Um, and then um, building on that, incorporating that into my end-to-end -end fulfillment process. So when the customer receives the order entry, that you then also, um, you know, move along and and give the customer that that milestone profile of when to expect the goods. And if something happens, send an alert. And, and it goes even further, even when the goods are received, um, follow up with the customer, ask about the delivery experience and feed the data from the delivery experience back into your system. So you know more than just, you know, my the truck was on time and the truck was delivered in full, but you also know friendliness of the truck driver. Did he always, you know, does he always um, go to the right dock door, things like that information that you otherwise wouldn't get, you can get through that customer experience piece that you can tack on towards the end of the process of visibility, which I think is pretty interesting to improve processes and learn something. What are the actual then the questions, demands, requirements that you hear from SAP's global customers regarding end-to-end -end supply chain visibility? Um, so there's, there's interesting questions, right? One question I always get is, well, you had supply chain event management in 2000 and I don't remember seven, five or seven ish, right? Which was a tracking and tracing solution at the time, a milestone profile, everything. Uh, and that's a, a perfectly fine solution. Um, if you are not running in a network, if you work with three to five suppliers and you're, you're managing those three to five suppliers and you get uh, status messages back from them and you wanna raise alerts and trigger business processes. What has been changing, and that's the question now, well, what's changed with the business networks? And I think the major changes in the business networks is of course that you work with more than just a handful of suppliers. You can work with anyone that's on the network. You can discover them, you can start interacting with them the next day or the next hour, if you like. So you have that agility and that, you know, that that freedom that eventually uh, leads also to, um, you know, to uh, to more flexibility in your business. But you also now manage much more than just um, the visibility piece. You do dock appointment scheduling. You do load tendering. You go into managing disputes directly with your network of partners. So you really, with you know, with with the solutions that are today available really broaden this business processes that, that you can do with uh, with your carriers. And then last but not least is this analytics piece uh, that I mentioned that based on all of this data that we now have available, um, you can really extract the insights and then based on all these insights, take fact-based decisions. Whereas in the past, it was more the gut feeling that something wasn't going right in a certain area where now you have Really, a data, you know, data points to take those decisions forward and make a make a, a good decision instead of an educated guess. Great, that brings us to the end. So, warm, warm thank you, Till, for joining Supply Chain Talks today, and also for the very strong partnership between SAP and Project Forty Four. We definitely see increasingly that this is an offering that is highly valued in the market. Thanks, Christian. Thank you for having me. It was good fun to talk about, about these topics. Thanks. Thank you.